Uh, I was told reliably by one of the organizers that you are the best conference audience ever, so I'm gonna hold you to that. <laughs> Bit of flattery always works. Uh, I'm Nat, uh, I am currently working at uh, Bob as a lead designer. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Bob because I think it's interesting to me, so you might find it interesting also. Uh, we're currently the UK's biggest green energy supplier. We got there by having, I think, the best experience for our customers, whom we call members, so um, if you hear me repeat that, that's why. Um, this isn't just about like the best customer uh, sort of service experience, this is about our uh, digital products that we produce uh, that are led by uh, our amazing design team and I think that sort of helped us succeed, at least I hope that that's part of it. Uh, Bob was started four, year, four years ago by Amit and Hayden. Um, and, uh, you know, four years ago, it was really, really small, supplied only a tiny handful of people in the UK with uh, gas and electricity. And it has grown quite fast. At the start of 2018, uh, we had already quarter of a million members being supplied with energy. And 100 people were working for Bulb. Uh, we call ourselves Bulb um, Now, we have 1.5 million members and over 500 people work at Bulb. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because I want you to get a sense of just how quickly we've grown and uh, you know, not just uh, in terms of our customer base, but also how many people work for the company. And the reason why I'm saying this is this had, has had an impact on how we do design and research and think about content design. Um, uh, a while back, uh, Bob had this approach to organization structure that is probably quite common in product organizations at the moment. We had designers, researchers, content designers, all embedded in product teams. Now, that approach had some challenges uh, one of them was that some teams were always really, really busy and needed tons of designer support and tons of researchers' time. Uh, on other teams, however, that support wasn't quite as needed in the same way. So they might have had some uh, you know, user-facing features to be delivered at a certain time, but uh, at other time we're focusing on slightly different tasks. So that sort of need for uh, different disciplines wasn't always evenly distributed. It also meant that on teams that were really, really busy, uh, designers had to be really proactive about meeting with other designers and sharing knowledge and sharing ideas across the company because they had such ambitious goals. And um, you know, there was one more reason why this, uh, this model uh, started sort of creaking at the seams for us. When we started, we had a, a handful of product teams and a handful of designers. Uh, now we have over a dozen of product teams and we don't quite have that many designers yet. Uh, so we decided to do something about it and change it up. The thing we did was to take our designers, content designers and researchers out of product teams and separate them a little bit. And what this allowed us to do is for each of those disciplines to uh, partner with multiple product teams at any given time. So for example, a designer might partner really closely with a couple of teams, same goes for a content designer, and a researcher might end up supporting multiple, uh, multiple teams. And there are some real benefits to this. Uh, one of them is that now it means that content designers, designers, and researchers sort of become this one team, uh, and it's, it's all of the disciplines that have a really big impact on the overall user experience, and having people be able to oversee a little bit uh, more sort of from a zoomed out perspective what's going on in different teams sort of help see that user experience holistically. Um, so we call ourselves content design and research because those are the disciplines that make us up. And this is where I come in. Uh, I started at Bob six months ago when this sort of change started occurring. And it has, 
you know, other benefits as well. It means that we can meet the needs of smaller teams, for example, a little bit better because now they don't need somebody to be embedded. They might just need somebody to help out from time to time. But it also means because we're working more closely together, uh, we're getting to share a lot more cross-discipline expertise really, really quickly and informally. Uh, it helps to set a, a consistent standard of work. Um, so when I joined, um, you know, um, it was at the start of this process, and uh, I was really, uh, really committed to making sure that this sort of new team that was being formed uh, was going to be really high effective and really good at meeting the needs of the rest of the company. And you might think that it's really easy to do step one, which is put some really smart people in the team, uh, and then step two, the team immediately starts doing amazing work, just magically happens. Um, unfortunately, that's not quite right. It doesn't really happen like that. Uh, Google invested uh, a lot of money in research. Uh, they did it a while back um, into what it is that makes teams high performing. They looked at all kinds of different models. So they looked at teams, uh, uh, how teams structure themselves, how they divvy up the work, what kinds of people work in those teams, what roles they have, how they communicate with each other, either you know, uh, what tools they use, all of these kinds of things that might have some kind of impact on you know, how well the team gels together. And what they found was actually that uh, it really matters how the team works together, and it matters a little bit less who is in that team. Um, Researchers found that well, the difference between the good and the dysfunctional teams was that the good teams like, treated one another in this kind of special way. There was something about that way in which they uh, worked together that worked really well despite all their differences. And that way of working together, this kind of phenomenon of like, relating to each other um, in this really positive way, uh, it has a name and it's called psychological safety. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it because I think it's a really, really uh, interesting idea, even though it's very, very simple and it, once you hear about it, really obvious. So psychological safety is this feeling that you can admit that you don't know something to your colleagues and nobody will think that, you know, um, you're, you're an idiot or something. People will just accept that, you know, we all have gaps in knowledge and that's perfectly normal. It's the feeling that... Um, you can safely say that you disagree with somebody and it's not going to damage your relationship. Uh, you're not going to hold it against one another. It's a feeling that you can make mistakes and when you do make mistakes, people aren't going to you know, berate you for it and they're not going to make you feel bad uh, because we all make mistakes and that's perfectly normal. And that feeling of being able to make mistakes also engenders this feeling that you can take risks because when things go wrong, your teammates will have your back there'll be understanding, you know, you can deal with stuff together. So it's a lot easier to, um, to be risky. And all of this together, uh, you know, means that you can really be yourself because you don't have to impress anyone. Uh, you know that whatever happens, your teammates won't think any less of you. And it's just like a, a, a space where you can, you know, be yourself and not pretend to be somebody else. So I'm hearing in your heads, because I have an extremely good hearing. Um, why are you telling me this now? This is like such an obvious idea and so simple in hindsight. Um, so in order to answer this, I just want to do a bit of audience participation. So if you could raise your hands if you currently work in a team. Okay, now, if you, no, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Um, if you're responsible for managing a team or you, uh, you've got lead in a title or a sort of direct responsibility for a team well-being, put your hand down. Everybody, keep your, everybody else keep your hands up. Okay, people who have your hands up, I'm talking to you today. You're not off the hook, although you can put your hands down. Uh, because I wanna, what I want to say is that you have a responsibility in investing in team dynamics and to help your team do well. Um, don't wait for the head of design or the creative director or whoever looks after your team for them to somehow magically set it up because if you wait for that, that will never happen. It's your responsibility too. And 
it's, you know, it's your responsibility because modern work is really a little bit like this. It's people from different disciplines trying to solve problems together, uh, complex problems, and you're more than likely to be working in an environment like that. And even at Apple, uh, when I work, or went on, to, on the recruitment site, I could see that you know, loads of promotional videos and loads of descriptions of different roles, they were featuring you know, words like collaboration and teamwork, making relationships with people in different areas of the company to do amazing work together. And this is a still from one of the promo videos about uh, a role in uh, software and services. So even at Apple, it's very clear that the work is actually very collaborative. Um, and when I started thinking about this talk, uh, one of my colleagues reminded me of this show called Voltron Legendary Defender. And it's about these five characters that work together as a team really well. And they sort of come together as this big robot, that one. Uh, and each one of the characters controls a, a hand or a leg or the head. And the thing is, they're all completely different. They have different skills, different interests, different weaknesses, and they have to collaborate really, really closely, communicate constantly in order to be able to adapt to any situation that is thrown at them. So when teams work together well, this is what it feels like. So everything is better than the sum of its parts, literally. And when themes don't come together too well, you get situations like um, you know, the English national team uh, playing football, uh, I'm, I'm not very good at uh, the sport and stuff, so please don't help me to that. But when I first moved to the UK around 2005, you know, I'd already heard about Beckham and uh, Rooney and uh, Lampard, and I knew that they were amazing football players, you know, like people really at the top of their game, uh, so famous that, you know, I even heard of them uh, in a different country. And yet somehow, uh, when they came together as a team, they, um, I guess, underperformed internationally. They couldn't bring together the, uh, the accolades that people really wanted from them. Um, so when sports teams don't deliver, that's quite visible, and that's under spotlight. Um, but when teams that we work in don't quite deliver, it can also feel a little bit, not like a high stakes failure to do something amazing, but sort of like hobbling along, not quite reaching your full potential. So at Bob, when I first joined, it was really on my mind to think like, how can we make this new team that's just starting to form really, really great? And cake bribery was one of the, one of the ways. But I'm gonna actually give you some useful tips that you can uh, start you know, uh, acting on straight away today. And these are the kinds of things that I sort of wished uh, when, I back, when I was back at university that someone would have told me that this was gonna be like, not just an important part of working life, but also something that I can do myself uh, and influence. So the things that you can do are uh, the kinds of behaviors that help foster the feeling of psychological safety in the team, help build that. One of those is to receive feedback graciously. Um, People always talk about giving feedback really well and finding a way to deliver feedback to people in a way that will really land and they will really hear your message. Um, I don't think it's talked enough about receiving feedback well. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's a little bit sad because receiving feedback without getting defensive or uh, argumentative is a, is a real way to reward people for taking a risk on you, for coming to you with some truth that they want to tell you about and um, realizing that you know, they can do that with you and be open with you, and that's really nice. I really recommend this book, uh, Thanks for the Feedback. Um, it talks about some strategies for recognizing your own responses to feedback and how to improve them. It helped me realize that when I hear critical feedback, I get this really sinking feeling in my stomach. Uh, I get really, a real rush of blood to my cheeks. I feel suddenly hot and really panicky and want to get defensive. And the technique uh, I've tried and that works really well for me is uh, slowing down and asking lots of questions. And it helps me understand what feedback someone is trying to give me and understand more about the context. But it also buys me time to get over that Initial, uh, initial feeling of defensiveness and to be able to handle it well. Um, you should read it, it's great. 
Another thing you can do is admit that you're wrong. Um, as you progress through your career, um, the cost of mistakes will get higher and higher. So it becomes more and more important that people can tell you when you've missed something or when you've made a mistake or when your opinion doesn't necessarily hold water. Uh, an easy way to, I found, to do this is to make it like a regular part of my process. Anytime I talk about uh, work that I've done or some experiences we've had at work, uh, I, I try to also talk about things that haven't gone well and you know, admit some mistakes I've made or uh, information I should have had but didn't find in time or whatever it is, just to sort of normalize this idea that it's fine to talk about these things and it's perfectly normal and that's what happens in the process. Another thing you can do is to disagree and commit with your, with your team. Uh, when you make decisions together that you're not fully on board with, uh, it's a real show of respect to still commit 100% to you know, back up your teammates and still deliver great work. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really an amazing opportunity to show that you still respect them even though you can't always see eye to eye on everything. And the final of your individual actions that I want to talk about is helping everyone be heard. Uh, researchers for Google, when they did the project I told you about, found that in teams that were really high performing, people were taking almost equal amounts of space to speak. Um, so there are some things that you can do to help that situation arise if it doesn't naturally exist. Uh, one of those things is if you own some meetings, you can send out clear agendas uh, beforehand so that people have time to think about questions and prepare uh, and come already prepared to speak. If you don't organize meetings, you can ask meeting owners to do the same so that everyone has an equal chance to be ready. Um, if you have remote participants in the meeting, include them and specifically ask for their opinions or input. It's sometimes really hard to come in to speak as someone who's participating remotely. So if you can help that process be smoother, then you will start evening out how many people get to speak in the conversation. And something I'm finding particularly useful uh, when I'm uh, at work um, is when I organize workshops, uh, I might give out people specific roles, or if I have specific questions that I want us to discuss as a group, I might ask people to think about them uh, silently for a minute or two, write them down, and then uh, share with the group. And that means nobody gets left out. But I think there are also things that your culture can do, and culture is like, you know, you know, a set of repeating behaviors that you can set in motion once by doing something really good that people notice and also want to participate in. And once you get to that point, then you can step back a little bit and let other people uh, sort of keep that process going. And it's really, you know, if you can do that successfully with your culture, then you will have done something that will keep bringing you value uh, for a long time to come. So I want to talk about uh, a few tips for the kinds of things you can start to help build psychological safety using your culture. One of those things is setting expectations. Uh, when content design and research came together as like a very new team, uh, we ran a workshop on giving feedback. But one of the first steps we did in that workshop was uh, writing down just some really simple expectations about what we wanted from one another on that day. And there were really obvious things like being honest or being empathetic, which is you know, kind of like a standard expectation you might have from any human interaction. But putting it on paper and actually saying it out loud made it really clear that like, no, actually we did expect that from one another and made it into like, a thing we were ready to give each other. And it's such a simple but effective trick and such a simple idea. And it works at those small scales in the team, but also works on their company level. At Bob, we have shared values uh, that we use all the time, especially when, you know, when we're trying to make a decision. Sometimes it comes down to our values. Um, and recently, we had a workshop where we reviewed those and looked at them again and had a conversation about are the values that we had when we were really small still the values that make sense for us now that we're bigger? Are we missing anything? Is there anything that needs to be there that we haven't had? 
And as you can see from uh, the stickers here, some people really didn't like the phrase that we don't obfuscate. Couldn't say why. Making space for feedback is really important. Some of the cultural behaviors that you can start are, for example, pairing on work together, sketching things together. These don't have to be very formal things. In fact, the more informal they are, the better. Um, you can just do those ad hoc with uh, people across different disciplines. If you do those well, and people come out of them feeling like, you know, you've had ideas together and you've contributed together, then they're more likely to re replicate them. And above, we realized that that was such a powerful thing that, you know, this sort of like easy exchange of ideas, really informal stuff, that uh, we organized this thing called a studio. Uh, and it was a very temporary thing, but we basically all sat down together at a single table, even though at the time we were still uh, sort of separated all across, uh, across the whole office. Uh, so we didn't normally sit together. And doing these sort of studio days when we did meant that we got to talk about the work that we didn't necessarily know that people were doing or haven't heard that much about or got to find out loads more really interesting detail and were able to contribute to one another. Uh, and that made us decide to actually sit together so that sharing of feedback and sharing of insights could become something that just happens all the time without us having to uh, really try to make it happen. Show and tells are an amazing way of sharing and celebrating work and making sure that people can see what else is going on and can, you know, can get involved if they want to. The secret to really good show and tells is to keep them really low key, really informal, uh, make it easy for people to present without having to prepare something or prepare slide decks or anything like that, and make it really easy to share work in progress so that uh, you get to see stuff before, well before it's released. This picture is actually from one of the early show and tells uh, at the previous office that Bob had before I got uh, to, to the current size. Um, and now we're so big that there are always loads of different show and tells across the whole company uh, looking at slightly different, uh, different themes or different groups of people. And it's, you know, it works because it's such a simple uh, and easy to pull off idea. And we do that on a bigger scale as well. We have an all hands meeting every Friday where again, in a very low key way, people just get to show their work amongst other updates. Um, and it's really fun to see what other people are up to. Uh, and it feels really good to celebrate it together. And the final thing on culture I wanna leave you with is that culture can help you be really reflective about processes and how the teams are working together. So it's a really, really important uh, component here. Um, one of the things that you can do is run uh, retrospectives, uh, either ongoing one about uh, team processes in general, or they could be project specific about something that um, has just been delivered or finished. Um, in a super low-key way, this could be just going for lunch with your colleagues and talking to them about how they're doing and how the recent work has gone, has, and you know, if there are any thoughts or reflections, it doesn't have to be particularly structured. So I want to finish by answering this question, is this design? Now, I happen to think that it is, because if you work in a collaborative environment, helping your team do well is part of your job. And, you know, it's like a meta-level skill that will help you get better at all the other skills, because it will mean that you'll be working in teams that are much more likely to be high-performing and much more likely to let you um, be your best and make the most of your craft skills. Um, I don't think design is just about, you know, using Sketch or being able to work with design systems. It is about being able to work in a highly collaborative culture uh, and do really amazing work. So, uh, you're not off the hook. Thank you.